Hey guys, this is Scott with Sam IT, the show where we talk about IT and business and cover a lot of bases because IT is a huge field today. We're going to do something a little bit different. I want to read through a bleeping computer article about a CDK global cyber attack that impacts thousands of U.S. car dealerships. This one's interesting, as most of these are, because there's a lot that we can learn from reading this article. A lot. And it's worth doing this because there's a lot of things that we warn about. And as many of you know, I have a book that I wrote, Linux Administration Best Practices from Pack Publishing. It's available on Amazon. And a lot of these things are covered in there. And those things are not new from my book. It's not like I invented any of these things. So many of the things that just from this article alone, we know about CDK and the, the shops that deployed them, who their customers are, that we know a lot of things that were definitely wrong and definitely were known to be wrong at the time that they were deployed. And so there's, there's just a lot that we can learn from reading this article, assuming the information is correct. So let's dig in. All right, so what we know is the basics. These are, uh, CDK Global is a software as a service vendor for car dealerships, you know, people selling cars and trucks and that kind of stuff. They were hit, they claim, by a massive cyber attack, which we don't really know why they call it a massive cyber attack. Nothing in here implies it was massive. This was probably, as you will see, a very minor cyber attack. This was probably just an employee opening an email attachment. They're probably playing it off as a master, massive cyber attack to try to downplay their culpability, which, as we go through, I think is extreme just from what we know here. CDK Global provides its clients in the auto industry a SaaS platform that handles all aspects of car dealerships operations. It's got CRM financing, payroll support service, inventory back office. This stuff is huge, right? This is basically a ERP for the automotive industry. Now, first of all, if you're in any size, ERPs just generally don't make sense. I'm not saying 100% of the time, but generally they don't make sense. If you're a large business, you should be building your own because you have custom workflows and the expense of using a third-party ERP rarely makes sense. Everyone wants to do it because it's just easy from an internal IT perspective to not have to deal with making those decisions and you just have someone to point fingers at when things go wrong. But ultimately, these decisions are made by IT internally, made by companies, and when things go wrong with the third parties, being able to point fingers maybe gets you out of trouble with your investors, but it shouldn't because anyone who's doing this stuff should know that buying an ERP is rarely going to be the right choice. If you are going to buy an ERP rather than build your own, you should have a lot of documentation as to why you would do that because it is not the logical choice. That is not the, it's not where the smart money goes in most cases. There's always an exception if you happen to have exactly the right workflow that fits with a system and you can truly trust that vendor to an extreme degree. In this case, it's clear no due diligence was done, no even casual diligence was done because just reading this article, there's no possibility that anyone should ever have considered deploying the software. No one should have continued a conversation with this vendor knowing what they did. So it says right at the beginning, to use CDK services, car dealerships configure an always-on VPN to the SaaS provider's data centers, allowing their locally installed applications to access the platform. So two major things here. One, VPNs, this is not the 1990s. There is zero, absolutely zero excuse for 20 years for anyone using a VPN in this way. And for 25 years, it's been a no-no. Right. By the late 1990s, and I know because I worked in this industry, right, we already were past the point that we needed VPNs for the vast majority of applications, and certainly applications like this by the late 1990s. Microsoft's DNA architecture was like 97, 98, and that stuff already eliminated VPN as a need. Some people still deployed them on top of other mechanisms, and that's okay. They wouldn't have been needed. Right. By the time that we had SSL for websites, the uh, VPN mechanisms all but were useless. There was some amount of time, there was some limited use of them. But this is once again a warning for all of you. If you have VPNs, stop and think. Are they purely additional? Would you be completely secure without them? And do they punch a hole that adds an additional risk? Or are they just 100% an additional component on top? As long as they're purely additional, then they're not a risk. They may not make sense, but they're not a risk. But if they are not purely additional, if they are not superfluous, then they represent a massive risk to your environment. So you should go out and look for your VPNs because if you have one, you need to think twice. Okay, the second part is, why did they have locally uh, installed applications? Now, this is not quite a never, right? Unlike the VPN, but in this day and age, and by this day and age, I mean for the last 
15, 20 years, why would we have locally installed applications in something being used in a business? I understand a lot of businesses are still running really old, really bad software. But again, these are red flags that people should have known. And if you're in a large business with, with deep pockets, why would you ever entertain installing something like this when it doesn't make any sense? Something was obviously wrong. The VPN told you that there's nobody who installed this and didn't know better, right? No one. It doesn't even take having an IT department, any business person who's thinking through logically how a VPN works, what its function is, what happens when you install it, that alone, of course, you expect them to turn to IT and get good advice. Of course, you can look at any website. We've been preaching this stuff for decades, right? We've been teaching this in the schools. We've been putting it in the books. Best practices have said no VPNs for so long. Nobody has an excuse to think that they're okay since the, the mid to late 2000s, right? That was the end of the last excuses. Today, unthinkable. But then to also have to have an application installed to talk to something like this makes no sense. That was an additional red flag that the software wasn't being updated, that they weren't maintaining it, that they weren't seeing themselves as a viable production platform. Now, once in a while, you have companies that just take decades to get caught up. And maybe you could excuse that if this was a side project and not important. So what it tells us is that no one installing this, ignoring the VPN piece, nobody from the people making the software to deploying the software really saw it as a serious piece of software. They all saw it as just some gimmick that they were using on the side. So everyone's reaction that this is causing outages to business means that someone was making decisions with a, a mismatch of approach here. Clearly, CDK didn't see this as a production project product. They can't make that claim, right? There's no possible way that they can say this was meant for businesses to actually use and no business can install it and say, well, we thought that they thought that. No, of course not. That would be dishonest. Okay. So that's, that's, a, that's just the starting point from that. Last night and into this morning, CDK Global uh, suffered a cyber attack that caused it to shut down its IT systems, phones, and applications to prevent the attacks spread. So this, this is another flag. Yeah, they shut down their systems and applications. Good. Like that's, that's the right thing to do. They shut down their phones. Why are their phones, the actual platform of their phones, somehow exposed to this data? This suggests that someone did something insane, like, I don't know, installing Cisco phones, for example. Uh, that would be a platform that everyone knows not to do. No phone professional will ever do, right? Cisco phones and things like that, where you have locally installed servers, um, with the rarest exception, are only installed when you have uh, uh, someone in management who a salesperson got to and they refused to listen to just basic IT best practices and common sense, let alone getting IT advisors involved or phone professionals, right? No one who calls themselves IT or phone can, can ever, you know, be like, this is a serious platform and you should install it. Clearly, you don't install phones that could be affected like this if you take your phone system or your general security or stability or, you know, uptime seriously. So there's something's wrong there, not nearly as serious as the other things. And, and a customer wouldn't likely be aware of something like that. But it is important to know for people who are not familiar, companies who use things like Cisco phones, these are things that create really visible flaws in your system, right? If I walk into, let's say a car dealership, and I look on a desk, and I see a Cisco phone, and I'm a bad actor, that tells me that politics are taking uh, precedence over good IT security profits. These are super expensive systems that are super insecure, and really really, really just inappropriate to be putting into a normal business scenario. As a business owner, I would never allow something like that. Such a bad idea from so many levels between the, the vendor that is not generally a good actor to a product design that is not good to just being a famous poster child in the industry for a product used to, to fool uh, uh, managers who are easily tricked into not uh, checking with their IT departments or just applying common sense uh, or looking into information online about what they're deploying. So if you see that on a desk, right, that is a, that's a trigger. This is a very high probability target that their other systems are not going to be secure. And of course, this played out, right? We don't know what phones they had here, but we'll just assume it's something like Cisco. And that would say, well, they probably also use VPNs and other foolish things that people should and do know better and are just, they don't care, right? And then we have the VPNs. Okay, so they shut down everything. 
the CEO of Proton Dealership IT, a cybersecurity and IT services firm for car dealerships, told them that the uh, two dealerships, uh, two data centers, one offline in the middle of the night, employees at multiple car dealerships have told Bleeping Computer that not very much information has been shared by CDK. Well, it seems like a company that didn't care about their dealerships to begin with, so this should come as no surprise. Anyone who deployed something with a VPN and a locally installed agent and what little they probably knew about the phones, if anything, should not be expecting them to also care because it's clearly not production ready. Why would they now have a mindset of caring about customers or being production ready? Uh, all they did was send out, it says, an email warning that they suffered a cyber incident. It says, we are currently experiencing a cyber incident. Out of caution and concern for our customers, we have shut down a majority of our systems. We are currently assessing the overall impact and currently have no ETA. Now, of course, if they were in any way right, um, professional and doing good IT, they would just have backups ready to go and have some really general ETA. Right, So we know there's something wrong here because uh, even if the hardware is all destroyed, if it was a fire, flood, anything like that, um, external backups, they should be able to at least slightly estimate how long it's going to take those to pull those backups. It could be, oh, these are coming down really slow, two to four days. It could be they're coming down really fast. It could be an hour or two, right? It could be anything. And it could be, oh, we have to get hardware and then pull these down because we don't have anywhere to put it. We, have, we don't know how to go to a cloud data center, which is another problem here. Why is are they waiting for their existing data centers to come back up? Because they probably have physical VPNs and other things that these are not limitations. Now, these are not quite as, as terrible, but other reasons that designs like this are not viable today is that we expect modern vendors to be able to move to new data centers at the drop of a hat. Oh, you lost everything. There was a fire flood. An entire city was wiped out. No problem. Take your backups that are located somewhere else and restore them to another data center. As someone who's been making this stuff for 25 years, these are not hard things to do and are so just built into the DNA of being a competent IT person or software person that you have to go out of your way to block being able to do this. The native every tool that is available today would allow you to simply spin up in any data center. So the question is right now, why are they not spinning up in another data center and why in the first one or two hours of the outage do they not have some rough ETA on that? Of course it could be wrong, but a rough ETA should be available if they have backups. Some of these employees have also shared concerns that threat actors could use the always-on VPN to pivot to internal network or car dealerships. This makes no sense. The VPN would only be there for the purpose of exposing the car dealerships. You don't put in a VPN for any other purpose, right? Its job is to poke a hole in security measures and expose one network to another. This is not a concern. This is what it's doing. Right, So the expectation from the person who installed the VPNs and the person who demanded that VPNs be used for this task was that the dealerships be exposed to any risk that happened to the central network and that the central network be exposed to any network at uh, any dangers or risks at the dealerships. VPNs require a complete 100% trust of all the connected systems. Something you should never have in a uh, in a non you know a don't trust environment. The last thing you want is to have to have 100% trust in everything you do. An IT professional for one dealership told Bleeping Computer that CDK advised them to disconnect the always VPN out of caution. No IT person should have needed to, to have been told that. Those should have shut off immediately. But of course. Someone was had them on in the first place, so there was already a not to, in every piece here, right? No dealership could be using this and not accepting that security doesn't matter because every dealership, no dealership can make the claim that they thought VPNs were okay. That is not a plausibly deniable piece of knowledge. That is so just basic networking, that is so anti-best practice, that is so drilled into basic IT for so long it is absolutely unacceptable for anyone to try to make the unbelievable claim that they didn't know that by turning on the VPN that they were absolutely putting everyone at risk and that was an accepted risk. Now, that they said, I was told to do it, that the decision was made that, that security didn't matter, that's fine. Absolutely. Businesses get to make their own judgment calls, but they can't act like it's a caution thing. They can't act like they're concerned that it might be like that. This is just how it works. Okay, uh, well, so then they have some things about some old credentials they're kind of using, but, but products aren't working properly. That's a little bit weird. Uh, <laughs> widespread disruption. Out, uh, obviously, dealerships everywhere are down. They can't do anything because everything they do is reporting on it. Some people are back to 
paper and pencil, this gets pretty, pretty fluff here. Um, basically, they're just explaining what a complete outage means. Uh, obviously, dealerships are losing a ton of money, but, but they planned on it. They installed, they knew that this wasn't secure. They knew this wasn't professional, and they knew that the vendor was not taking this seriously in any way or caring about their customers. Those are facts. Those are indisputable facts. So every single dealership should have had some plan for this because it was an expectation. It is absolutely dishonest for any dealership to try to pretend they didn't know. And it's definitely dishonest for CDK to claim they had no IT professionals on staff, no software engineers on staff, because anyone with the modicum of business knowledge, software knowledge, or IT knowledge has to have known how bad all these things were. Uh, Bleeping Computer has been unable to confirm this independently, but if it was a ransomware attack, the outages will act last for a while. Shouldn't Ransomware attacks last so little that normally they don't get disclosed. That it's disclosed means that it's more than a ransomware attack. Just guaranteed. Uh, once all data has been stolen, threat actors, they encrypt all the devices. So there's definitely a possibility that a bunch of data was stolen. We don't actually know that. They, in theory, should have been monitoring for some of that, but that's relatively difficult to do. And given the other things, they didn't take the easy security precautions. There's no reason they would have taken the hard ones. Um, the encrypted devices, uh, stolen double extortion where the threat actors demand a ransom payment to provide a decryptor and to delete and not publish stolen data. Um... These negotiations can take weeks. Now, one of these uh, that they said in here, and I missed where they said it, but uh, they said that they uh, had heard a rumor that their backups have been also encrypted. And this is really worth digging into because every single ransomware attack is an announcement of not having backups, right? Real backups. And again, check my book. This is stuff that people who do backups, right? I've worked in the backup industry. Everyone who works in systems administration is familiar with backups. To be a truly industry accepted backup, it must be decoupled. A coupled storage mechanism is not a bad thing, but it is not a backup. A lot of people hear the phrase that snapshots are not backups. So snapshots are just the most coupled type of storage. It's so tightly coupled that any disruption in the main storage is going to cause a problem. But when you're dealing with backups, you must be fully decoupled to classify as a backup. Otherwise, it could be some kind of useful storage, but not yet a backup. It could be on its way to becoming a backup, as snapshots often are. Snapshots are a beautiful tool for eventually becoming a form of backup, but they are not backups while they are snapshots on their own. So to be a backup, we know it was decoupled. Well, if their network was ransomware, how did their backups become ransomware as well if they're fully decoupled? This implies the completely ridiculous situation that they're claiming that they were ransomware and their backup system, which is decoupled and independent, was also ransomware. They would have to do this at exactly the same time. So not only is it a full double ransomware attack that is being claimed, this is the rumors, the CDK has not said this, but that it was also coordinated so that they would commence at exactly the same moment or so close that people were not able to stop one and fix the other or whatever. This is not plausible. While if you were talking about a state-sponsored attack against a military installation, we would say, well, that's the kind of thing you would do to try to get through some of those things. But when you're dealing with a company and a reasonable amount, there's absolutely no way, right? You're talking the, the expenditure to carry off an attack of that nature would be far greater than the value of 15,000 dealerships, right? I know that sounds crazy, but it would be. That's a really, really monumental thing that is being implied by the rumor in that case. Doesn't make any sense. It's not how the real world works. In the real world, vendors who are going to run VPNs like this are just going to have phone systems that are not hosted and decoupled that are going to use. Um, and, and they also said this in the article that the, uh, the software that was installed, the agent, which was unthinkable that there was an agent in the first place, but marginally acceptable, had administration privileges. So it was being installed as the administrator. So an untrustworthy piece of software from an untrustworthy vendor was installed with root or admin privileges on desktops inside the environment with unlimited network access to a central vendor and 14,999 other dealerships, all of which are inherently insecure by the nature of having worked with this vendor. The one thing you know about all 15,000 dealerships is not one of them took security seriously in the most minuscule way. And then a vendor that connects them all together who actively promoted an anti-security mechanism, 
Yeah. So then installing that agent with admin privileges that can do anything to your computers, include hide anything that's going on, install anything that it wants, attack other things from it. Holy cow, the level of how did anybody, let alone 15,000 dealerships, see this and go, we're going we're, we're gonna to live with that. And, and then, right, of course, once you have that level of problems to say, oh, but they really did have good backups and this, this monumental attack on their backups happened? I don't think so. It's really, um, it's really that they didn't have backups. That's, there's no reasonable case where they had backups here. And just to give some examples, if they were in a cloud data center, let's say Vulture, Amazon, DigitalOcean, uh, Azure, right, any of those, and they used the backups provided by their platform, they'd be 100% protected in this case, 100% protected. Uh, within the reason of maybe the last few hours, maybe even a day of data is gone, but they would be back up and running extremely quickly. Uh, let's say they were doing very traditional backups and going to tape or disconnected hard drives or anything like that, 100% protected with the same 24-hour uh, or whatever caveats. No way for those things to be destroyed because they're not connected to the systems. Even if they're writing to something like a Backblaze or a uh, Wasabi that has uh, version control or write protections, again, no way to wipe them out. No amount of hacking their systems is going to get into that backup unless somehow someone creates created a coupling to turn it into not a backup. It just doesn't work that way. So the degree to which the most basic protections had to be ignored in order to create a scenario where a ransomware would be effective is so extreme. And that's what we have to accept. And in almost all these cases, if you look at ransomware especially, but other types of attacks as well, but ransomware attacks that happen to big companies or small ones, but big ones are the ones that hit the news. And you really read into how could this have happened? And you look at what we know, and in this case, we know a lot because they announced the VPN, they announced the agent, they announced the administrator privileges, they suggest the, the backup system. All of these things say, oh, this took so many mistakes by the vendor and so many mistakes by their customers together and no, apparently the customers weren't taking backups, but they probably couldn't because if you're doing all these things, right, uh, who's providing backups and who looks for them? But this is so obvious, so easy to point out when you dig in and don't let the rhetoric of, oh, woe is us. It was so hard. We got, it was unforeseen circumstances. No, it was completely foreseen circumstances. Every single person who knew about these factors knew that this was what was going to happen eventually. It had to. Statistically, it must. And then, of course, you know, they act like it's a big cyber attack. But when you have all of these things going on, what are the chances that your workers, which they have thousands of, are all secure themselves? That your internal networks are secure when your external are not? That your people are taking security seriously at work when you don't with your customers? That doesn't really make sense. While not impossible, it's very implausible. So our expectation here is that one of their thousands of people who probably all have access to the VPN, who probably all have access to the internal networks, who probably all are running as administrators on their own computers, probably just opened an email from some website that they shouldn't have visited or some spam that was sent to them, and that thing spread through all the network and infected everyone else exactly as you would expect. There's no reason to expect that they had some major attack against them. There's no reason to think that this is sophisticated. Chances are, from everything we've seen, it is as simple as that. And as always, security is just about simplicity. The easiest things, the most common sense, the little bits of effort generally protect us. And as I talk to you know thousands of businesses all the time, and one of the things we always say is if you have good backups, these things that you see in the news, these scary things, these aren't things you have to worry about. I know that these big companies seem like they have deep pockets and lots of capability, but they don't. They may have deep pockets, but they don't prioritize the things that matter, like basic IT, basic common sense, best practices, mostly because they're probably a publicly traded company. And if their shareholders are not holding them accountable, why would they bother? There's probably some way to get a kickback from, who knows, a VPN provider who's going to pay you a little bit of money. Hey, don't modernize your systems. Just keep paying us and we'll send you on a little vacation. We have no reason to believe that that's what happened here. But we know something happened here to make a really bad idea that was not cost effective happen. Why would that happen? Why would they give up customers? Why would they create a more expensive network for no benefit? 
somebody had to be benefiting. Was it laziness? Was it abject incompetence? Was it outright sabotage? We don't know, but you can see the signs of it over and over and over again. This is an endemic problem that was not being addressed and customers were not holding them accountable to it. Potential customers probably were holding them accountable to it, but we don't see them here. We don't know how many tens of thousands of dealerships didn't do business with them because they looked at this and said, <laughs> no, right? But we'll never know how many they lost because they did these things. But we know that 15,000 were okay with it and all their shareholders are okay with it. And that's something that those shareholders have to ask themselves. Why were we okay with something that anybody casually looking knew was so financially non-viable in the long in the long term. Thanks for joining me. Uh, if you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. Let me know down in the comments uh, if you know anything more about this particular topic. If you see anything else that's screaming mistakes in uh, this article or others, uh, if you've got other articles for me to dig into, if you like this format and going into these kinds of things, let me know. That would be great. Like and subscribe, and I'll see you all next time.